breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate primarily purpose was to protect the heart of the warrior. He needed to make sure that the armor bearer knows how to take care of that breastplate. See that warrior would get back from battle. And he'd take that armor off and he'd give it to that armor bearer. And that armor bearer had to check it out. It was his job to clean it. Clean it. it was his job to polish it. It was his uh, job to check it for defects. It was his job to make sure the straps are right. And that warrior would have to teach him. Now here's what you look for on this armor. I'm giving it to you. Now look at it. Look at it. You see that pierce mark? That's where a sword came at me. And he tried to run it through my heart. But the, the breastplate protected me. Now you look at it. We need to take this one and have it mended. We need to make it strong again. That breastplate protects the heart. We've got to teach them to put on the breastplate. We need to let them know that righteousness is the way you protect yourself. Right living. I said right living. That warrior had to show him right living. If I'm going to keep my heart right at all times before the Lord. If I'm going to give him a breastplate of righteousness to wear his armor, then he's got to see righteousness in his father. He's got to be able to see it. He's got to be able to understand it. Amen. He's got to hear daddy cry out sometimes. Create in me, O oh Lord, a clean heart and renew me a right spirit and help me, God, to do what's right. Uh, Amen. It's imperative that we, we live a life pleasing to the Lord. Uh, to teach the generation to come that we just can't live any way that we want to. But we've got to follow the word. And we've got to spend, spend time in the spirit of the Lord. And it's only by him and through him that we obtain righteousness. Isaiah 64 and 6 says, But we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Isaiah 59 and 17 says, For he put on righteousness as a breastplate. And a an helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. And was clad with zeal as a cloak. He put on that breastplate of righteousness. As a man thinketh in his heart. As a man thinketh in his heart. I'm going to say it again. As a man thinketh in his heart so is he your attitude shines through your heart is exposed through your attitude oh I feel like preaching don't tell me you're righteous when you ain't got no rightness in you. When your heart's not right. When you're walking around in deception. The scripture tells us that the heart is deceitfully wicked. And the only way that it can get right is if I get full of the Holy Ghost. So I got to put on that breastplate of rightness. Of righteousness. Go ahead and speak against me. I've got a breastplate of righteousness. You're not going to pierce my heart. Uh, go ahead, throw stones at me. i got my breastplate of righteousness. I'm still going to do what's right, uh, even though it ain't popular, uh, even though that others can't understand what's going on. Well, how come you're doing that? Didn't they throw stones at you? Yeah, but I'm still going to do the right thing. I'm still going to do the right thing. It's the only way I know. I watched a man get taken advantage of. I watched a man, amen, who wasn't a preacher. 
People talk about them. Say bad things about them. Gossip about them. But he never did the wrong thing. I've always watched him do the right thing. And if he even thought he was doing the wrong thing, he'd go to prayer. I've watched a preacher make a fool of himself. And the church board and body want to rise up. We got to get rid of that preacher. And I watched that man say, nope. We're going to stand by that preacher. We're going to help him out because it's the right thing to do. Come on now. Because it's easy to do the right thing when it doesn't cost you anything. It's easy to do the right thing when everybody agrees with you. But what about doing the right thing when people that you love don't agree with you? Why are you changing your dress like that? Why don't you go do this anymore? Why don't you go do that anymore? Why aren't you all guzzied up anymore? Because I've been changed. I'm trying to get right. Talk about me all you want. You ever notice, and this is just a side point, you ever notice how it is that uh, when uh, somebody goes and gets crazy, man, they can spike their hair, get a mohawk, and... You know, paint it six different colors. Do all kinds of craziness. And people just kind of look. That's just my crazy cousin. <laughs> but you let God get a hold of somebody's life. And clean that individual up. And get them walking right. And it's like, nobody understands. What happened to you? I'm trying to live for the Lord. Really? But, but, but why? We're wanting to go to Hank's place. Well, I don't want to go to Hank's place anymore. I don't want to go to that honky-tonk anymore. I've been delivered. I've been set free. I've been saved. I don't dress like I used to dress. Why don't you wear those tight-fitting clothes anymore, girl? Because I don't want the whole world to see my exposed self. <laughs> and I got the Holy Ghost inside me, and he wants me to be holy. So I'm trying to dress more modestly. I'm trying to be more like Jesus. Amen. Child with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You see, the preparation of the gospel of peace signifies a prepared and resolved frame of heart to adhere to the gospel and abide by it. It's that knowing that I'm just going to keep walking a steady pace and I'm not going to be turned to the right or the left. Come on, we've got to teach them how to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. I enjoy church. I enjoy coming to the house of worship. I enjoy dancing and shouting and running. Oh, that's great worship. But living for God really takes place outside that door. And you have to walk it. And there'll be Holy Ghost checks all throughout your day. Huh? Huh? Come on, sometimes it's the crazy preacher trying to run you over with a car, just seeing how you'll react. And sometimes it's somebody else aggravating you, and you have to sit there, and you just got to keep marching and keep walking because the, the, you, you know that things are going to happen to you. Uh, all the time, things are coming to, to destroy the peace in your life and des destroy the harmony in your home, and yet my feet are shod with the preparation of peace. So everywhere I walk, uh, peace goes with me. No matter what's turning upside down, I'm walking in the preparation. they got to understand, hey, life's not always easy, and the rain falls on the just and the unjust, but I'm walking in the preparation of peace. Uh, every uh, My heart's right. You don't have to worry. Uh, amen. Things can come against you, but you're going to be all right. That gospel of 
peace brings all sorts of peace. Peace with God. Peace within ourselves. Peace with one another. Amen. Come on, when you're not living for God, it's a nightmarish kind of thing. But when you get full of the Holy Ghost and start putting on the whole armor of God, amen, you can start walking in the peace uh, and the rest of the Holy Ghost. This allows for our lives to live a life of repentance. We're armed against temptations to sin and, and the designs of our, our enemy. He's trying to knock you out. He wants all these young people not to stay in church when they get to the age of accountability to leave their home. He, he wants you to leave the church when, when finally mama says, you don't have to, you know, you're not under my roof, you can do what you want. And you're like, well, good, I ain't going to church. I never liked Brother Bumgarner anyway. But now if you love Brother Bumgarner, you'll keep coming to church. James 1 and 12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Deuteronomy 28, 9, The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. Look at somebody and say, I want to walk in his ways. I want my feet to be shod. Because you know what? The enemy likes nothing better than to come cut the legs out from underneath you. But when you're shod with that preparation of peace, the shield of faith, next to the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith is to me the most important piece of armory. We must have it in our fight against the enemy. It is our weapon of defense to protect us when the enemy is pressing us the hardest. Paul said it would quench the fiery darts of the enemy. And when we have nothing else to stand on, amen, we have faith to stand our ground. That shield is able to Ward off the blows. We've got to teach the generation to come that faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. And that only by faith will we make it through the darkest hours of our life. Amen. I don't care how young you are. There are going to be some dark hours in your life. Some of you may have already been going through some dark hours. But know this. If you got a shield of faith. Now in the Old Testament. It was like this. That shield was made out of a cow hide. Or animal hide. If you've ever had to deal with any type of leather product, you know after a while you have to oil it. Or it dries out. Becomes brittle. Loses its strength. And in the book of 2 Samuel, you'll see where David writes, Arise and anoint thy shield. We need to make sure this generation knows how to anoint their shield of faith. Because without prayer in their life, they'll never understand how to anoint that shield of faith. Come on, that's what prayer is all about. Putting a fresh coat of anointing on my shield of faith. I don't want the fiery darts of the enemy getting through it uh, because I haven't anointed it, uh, because I haven't applied to it what needs to be applied. We've got to teach the generation that is coming, how to anoint their shield. The sword of the Spirit is an offensive weapon. And most people don't use it. If faith is our shield and a defensive weapon, If that's our defensive weapon, then that sword of the Spirit is our offensive weapon. And most people 
still don't use it. Brother Scoggins was preaching. He was saying at the end of the message, this is a year of restoration. And he said the one thing that we want to have restored around here is restoration of the Word of God. And they're lucky because Brother Bear, who is 79 years strong, has decided to retire there with his daughter. So on Sundays, they get to hear a lot of word. Amen. He still quotes about 130 scriptures per message from the word of God. But the word is powerful and quick and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why preaching is for the believer to be saved. The preacher comes in with the word of God. Amen. And the preacher can come in here with a word, a message, uh, and all of a sudden things we're battling in our minds, our spirit, he begins to cut through them to the core of us and we find a place of repentance. That's the power of the Word of God. I believe the Word of God must be put into the hearts of every young armor bearer. Because Proverbs says in 27 and 17, Iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. The Word of God says in 2 Timothy 2 and 15, you know it well, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. We've got to put the Word into our young people. I'm still believing that it won't take long, and I'm going to tell you something. What I'm fixing to say is not cheap. It costs a lot of money. But I'm praying that someday we have a Bible quizzing team out of Peace Tabernacle in Wharton, Texas. But those trips cost money. Those buzzers cost money. You're going to have to come up here and practice two and three nights a week with those kids and get that Word of God into them. But do you know this? That there is like a 95% retention rate of young people that participate in Bible quizzing. 95%. You want your child to be in the church when he gets older? Put the word of God in him. Teach him how to use it. Even Jesus, I was preaching this morning when he was being tempted of, of Satan. What did he say? It is written. He constantly went to the Word of God. And when you put the Word of God in you, uh, one writer said it like this, uh, Thy Word have I hid in my heart uh, that I might not sin against thee. This generation cannot be turned around by all the religiosity of the modern day world. Come on, there's a lot of religiosity out there. There's a lot of tongue talkers out there in this day and age. There's a lot of people proclaiming to be Pentecostal because they play a little up-tempo music and they got a nice little light show and, and they believe in dancing and they've got their praise dancers and they got their, their banner worshipers and they've got people prancing all over the church doing this and that, but they don't have the real stuff. Because we got to worship Him in spirit and in truth. I want our young people to have the Word of God in them. I want my children to know the Word of God. Psalms 119 and 105. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word. I'm never without a Bible. One thing I love about modern, eight, modern day electronics, gadgets, is that you can get a Bible app and put it on your phone. I love that. Now, I've got some very nice Bibles. I've got a nice Thompson Chain Study Bible. I've got a nice 
uh, uh, you know, just a leather, leather bound lambskin that Brother McLean. Oh, I love them. They're beautiful Bibles. If you look at it in that way, and I do. But I'm thankful when I'm walking down the street. Somebody the other day was like, well, you know, the Bible says so and so. And I'm like, where? No, I don't say that. <laughs> it says this. <laughs> How'd you do that? I got it on my phone. <laughs> I want that word of God with me. Now, I was one that used to carry my Bible to work with me. Set it there at my desk. One guy asked me one time, well, what's that for? I said, that's for me to keep killing you. <laughs> He's like, oh. <laughs> now, I know none of y'all have co-workers like that. None of y'all have to go and pray every once in a while, you know. Excuse me, I'm going to the bathroom. You're going to the Lord. If you don't help me with him, I'm going to knock the fire out of him. No, y'all don't know. I know y'all's all sanctified, folks. So. But there's times I've had to quote, you know, the Word of God because, hey, the enemy tries to use any means possible to bring you down. Especially when you're fasting. Try to fast and see what happens. Because the devil knows, man, if they start fasting, man, they're going to start being broken. If they get broken, they're going to get in the spirit. And if they get in the spirit, they're going to start pulling strongholds down. And I'm going to have to leave because they're going to have spiritual dominion over me. And so he's going to try to get you to be as carnal as all get out. Finally, and I'm trying to come to a close. The armor bearer must learn the art of prayer. Now, I, I'm a musician. I love music. Because no matter what I, was, what I would do, if I, if, if I was working just a secular job, I'd still be playing music. I love good music. I love good worship. I love it when it's right. I know what to listen for. I know when something's on pitch. I know when something's not in pitch. I know when somebody's playing the wrong chord. Making a fact. It's not that I don't like good music. I like good music. I believe the Word of God is true when it says to play skillfully with a loud noise. When I learned that scripture, oh, it was a day of rejoicing. Turn that down. But, Mom, the Bible says to play skillfully with a loud noise. Well, you're not playing skillfully, so turn it down. <clears throat> And, and music's good. I believe that it allows the Spirit of God to be welcomed into a place. It prepares the heart of the hearer to receive the Word of God. I understand its purpose, and I am thankful for it. But I'm going to tell you something. And I'm so thankful Sister Louisa has worked with us the last three years, and she's done a great job. But one thing I love and respect about her more than anything else is her, when she comes, she hits that prayer. She's not so much worried about that. She takes care of that. She does right. But she wants to pray. God, let me get in your... I hear, Lord, let me, let me be in the Spirit. Let me, let me do it right, Lord. Let me... I don't want to miss it. I want to make sure it's right. And I thank you for that, Sister Louisa. I'm not trying to embarrass you, but prayer to me is more important. If you haven't prayed, then you have no power for your praise. You can put something in the, the plug, but the breaker's flip somewhere else and you ain't got no power but when you flip the breaker and there's power to the circuit when you plug in hey man it's easy to praise god you're not having to repent uh, you're not having to get things right before you praise god you already did all that through prayer and i'll tell you this it's hard when you start praying and you get things right and you get into a flow of the spirit it's hard not to just let a praise break out in you we got to teach our young people that. It's not all about the hype of the drum. It's not all about the hype of the guitar or the piano or the organ. It's not all about the hype of somebody jumping up, bouncing up and down, singing. But it's about when I get into the power of the presence of God. I'm not, I'm not trying to. Pat Brother Bumgarner on the back, please don't think that. 
But being on the men's ministry team for the, for the district, I had to help lead services and stuff. And uh, I had to introduce Brother Blackburn before he preached. And as I was headed up there, the, the Holy Ghost just hit me with, To God be the glory. And the man handed me the mic, and I just started singing it. I, wasn't, I didn't need no music. I mean, the organ player, he, found, he was good when he caught me. And he started playing. We just started singing to God. And the men just began to rise up in that place. And they just began to worship the Lord. And it wasn't hyped up. But you know what? I had a man come up to me and said, Brother, in fact, it was Brother Mike Williams' dad. He come up to me and said, Brother Bumgarner, thank you for getting up there and leading us in that song of worship. He said, when you started singing it, you could just feel a sweet presence of the Lord just settle in there at room. We live in a day and age where they want it all hype. But you know what? If I can just get his presence to come and settle in. But before I ever got up there and started singing to God with glory, I was over in the corner saying, God, I want you to get me right. God, I want you to have your way in this service this morning. Lord, if I've done anything to offend you, would you forgive me, Lord? I want an apostolic move in this place. You see, church, we got to teach the young generation how to pray. You know what I covet in Peace Tabernacle? And I love everybody that does. I love prayer warriors. I love people that set aside time every day and pray. I love people that say, Brother Bumgarner, you don't have to worry. I got your back. I've been praying. I've been tearing down the strongholds. Come on, we've got to teach this generation. How to pray. Thursday afternoon, before I went to men's conference, I went and spent all Thursday afternoon with my bishop. Bishop McLean, you need to pray for him. His mind's coming, kind of going, kind of going. But he's still sharp in the things of the Spirit. And you know, we visited for five hours. And it seemed that he could go way back better than he could just recent. But he began to tell some stories. They'd work in the fields all day. Work in the crops or cutting pulp wood. And his dad, Brother Papa Yule as they called him, he had built on his flatbed truck some way of making it like a bus. And all the young people would crawl up on the back of that truck bed and they would go to rallies. Wintertime, summertime, springtime, fall. Outside, they rode, they sang, they worshiped, they prayed. Not this day and age. Oh, no. Not in this day and age. Right outside? Well, that's against the law, Brother Bumgarner. And that's why we miss it. Because if we're not careful, we're going to create a soft spiritual generation that doesn't know how to dig it out and pray for revival. Every great apostolic revival happened through prayer meetings. Believe me, I know my Pentecostal history and I can prove it beyond a shot. Not one time do I see it happening from somebody getting up and playing a guitar or putting on a light show. But when God's people begin to pray, Topeka, Kansas, they were praying. Houston, Texas, come on, right over the Rice area, uh, around Rice University, they were praying, they were seeking God, and God began to give revival. Alvin, Texas, they were having a prayer meeting in an orchard, and God gave revival. Azusa Street, uh, it was about praying. They had an apostolic revival. Amen. C.P. Kilgore talks about starting churches, having brush sharpers and people coming. But he had to pray two and three weeks at a time before anybody come. And back then, you know, they wasn't working and having revival. They were there trusting in God. Sometimes they fasted because they didn't have anything to eat. 
But they prayed and prayed and prayed. And if we're going to have an apostolic re revival tomorrow, we've got to teach our young people. We've got to teach our children. We've got to pray. We've got to pray. There's nothing more powerful than prayer. If you want to stay saved, pray. If you want to stay tuned in, pray. Talk to the Lord. Know him. Let him know you. First Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. First Timothy 2 and 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Uh, James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another. That ye might be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And I am burdened like I have never been burdened in a long time. I need to pray. I need to turn off gadgets. I need to turn off radios. I need to turn off computer. I need to turn off devices. And I need to get in my prayer closet. And I need to get a hold of the Lord again. I can't complain if I've got lost children. If I haven't been praying. I can't complain if i got a lost husband. If I haven't been fasting and praying. I can't complain if my children want to leave church uh, if they haven't heard me get down to business uh, and learn how to supplicate and learn how to pray and learn how to give things. Come on, church. Uh, I'm calling for some armor bearers today. I want to see our young people latch on to saints of God and saints of God. I don't want you to say, well, this is how we used to do it. I want you to say, this is how we do it. I don't want to hear how it used to be. I want you to do it now. Because I'm not interested, except for in the purpose of remembering the good things that happened in revival of times past. But you can't live in revival of times past. I could sit down with anybody in this church and, and story for story, we could talk about revivals of the past. I, could, I can do it. I got 43 years of worth of living for God. I can tell you some awesome things that have happened over 43 years. I've seen the death healed. I've seen somebody with eye problems healed. I had gallstones. I know what it feels like to have gallstones. And yet the surgeon's knife never touched this body. But the master surgeon touched this body on a Sunday night. And I can prove that because I've been to the doctor. I told him, well, you know, I had gallstones in the, I've had major gallstones. And he, he did this little test. And he says, you've never had gallstones. I got the x-rays to prove it. I had the sonogram. And yet, I don't want to live in yesterday's miracle. Lord, I'm seeking you for a miracle right now. I want my young men to come stand over here. I want the young ladies to come stand over here. I'm not trying to embarrass you. Come on, Isaiah. Come on, Elijah. The only thing that stands between them and eternity is you. It's not, a, it's not something I take lightly. 
I've been accused of being a hard preacher. But if I get to be a hard preacher sometimes because the burden of their souls start resting upon me and I feel the weight of it and I want to push against it. Because I love them. I love them with everything that's in me. I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about them. I go to sleep at night thinking about them. I wake up thinking about you. I worry about you when you're in school. I'm worried about what kind of fellas are talking to my girls. I'm worried about what kind of young ladies are coming around my boys. I've got teenage sons as well. And this world's pushing an agenda. I was reading something today on MSN.com where the lesbian and gay agenda is to wipe out Christianity. They want to totally destroy Christianity. And yet, I'm wondering, do I have some men that say, Pastor, you ain't got to worry about these young men. I'll get them and I'll pray with them. Isaiah, I don't want you to ever come to a prayer meeting again without coming and finding me. If there's no other man in this church, I want you to come sit by me. I want you to, I want you to hear me praying. You all right? He's got a blister. Y'all pray for his blister. <laughs> I want them to know we love them here. I'll let you go back over there because I don't want you to hurt yourself. But I want, I want some men in this church to get a hold of these young men and say, hey, we love you. We're going to teach you how to pray. We're going to walk beside you. We're going to encourage you to live for God. We're going to show you that real men know how to live for God. Huh? Real men live for God. Because we know it ain't the easiest thing to do. Oh, it's easy to be a sinner in the world today. It's easy to be a perverted man. It's easy to be a whoremonger in this day and age. But to stand up and say, no, I ain't going there. I'm not doing that. I'm not partaking of that. Mom, brother David, brother... Rodriguez was riding me and Brother David yesterday, and he was telling us some stories, things that happened to him. Make your hair curl. Look at mine. Because when he'd have to work away, the enemy was always trying to come at him. And he'd tell him, hey, I love my wife, and I love God, and I'm a man of God, and I don't want none of your mess. And I want you to know that if they, you know, it's out there. But it's our job. Can I get some men to come up here tonight? I know this is different, but this was a YTO and this is what I... I want some men to come and stand around these young men. I'd love for some Holy Ghost filled godly ladies. And I, don't, I want you to come and I want you to give these boys your number. I want them to know that they can call you. I want you to pray with them. I want you to invest in their lives. I want them to become your armor bearers. I want them to someday, I pray one of these young men will become a preacher of the gospel or one of these ladies be used for the glory of God, maybe even a preacher of the gospel, and they can stand up here and say, you know, when I was at Peace Tabernacle as a young lady, pastor preached a message about armor bearers, and Sister Brown, Monty Brown, you came to me and said, I'm going to pray with you. Ladies, I'd like for you to come be with these young ladies. I want them to know, hey, I'm with you. Now, we have an abundance of boys. We've got four young ladies here tonight. But we have more ladies in this church than we do boy, uh, men. We're working on that.
Come on, I just feel this, this is what we needed to do tonight. In fact, because we got so many, I want all the young ladies to get in the middle of all the ladies. And I want the ladies to make a circle. I'm excited tonight. I'm going to share something tonight that was birthed in me many, many years ago. I'm going to do my best to establish it here for Peace Tabernacle. I want our young men and our young ladies to know I love you so much. I want you to grow up and become something. To achieve something. And first and most, I want you to do that in the Lord. The Word of God says in Ephesians 6 and 11, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I am going to share with you tonight something that I envision. I want to talk about armor bearers tonight. I want to raise up a generation of armor bearers. The beautiful thing is in our children is that tomorrow they're the youth choir. And then they're the adult choir. We've got to do a better job, church, of raising up the next generation. Lord, I ask you to touch these lips of clay tonight. Anoint them, Almighty God. Anoint every ear to hear. Bring understanding to our mind. Help us, mighty God, to grow closer to you. Lord, we want to see an apostolic outpouring in Wharton, Texas at Peace Tabernacle. And for that, I give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In the church say amen. God bless you. I'm very thankful tonight for what the Lord is doing. And I know that our generation now youth have so much to give. But they need to be encouraged. They need to be told how important they are. They need to be given an example. I, I'm not preaching to them right now. I'm preaching to the moms and the dads. You're an example. I said it this morning to them. What you do is what they'll do. What you allow is what they'll allow to a greater degree. What one generation does in moderation, the next generation does in excess. And so, we need to understand that we're not just called to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and to reach the lost outside the church. But you're to reach into your home. My wife did such an eloquent and wonderful job on Mother's Day sharing a mother's legacy. But I believe that we need to raise up some armor bearers. An armor bearer was someone who was attached to a king or a mighty warrior. And it was from that individual they would learn the art of war. They were taught from the very beginning how to serve their king see we need to make sure the next generation understands what it is to serve we're, we're we're living in a day and age where we get it all twisted jesus said the chief among you will be servant of all and yet sometimes we get an attitude that you know, uh, I'm here to be served. I, I'm not no kingdom builder as far as self-kingdom. I'm not trying to build a kingdom for Brother Bumgarner. This is God's kingdom. I, I'm not trying to establish any kind of lordship. He, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One Lord above all, through all, and in you all. 
And we need to understand that tonight. God didn't call you to be used, uh, amen, to have people serve you. He called you to serve people. Servant leadership. Amen. I, I was taught from a very young age, serving. Whether it meant sweeping the floors, cleaning the bathrooms, working in the flower beds, mowing the yard. One of the things Brother Scoggins preached about uh, was the, one of the first abomination was a proud look, a prideful spirit, an arrogant spirit. Amen. Someone said, Brother Bumgarner, you're so approachable. Aren't I supposed to be approachable? I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I'm a child of God. You should be able to approach me. I don't understand preachers. Maybe I'm just going to preach what I'm feeling in my spirit. In the generation where we, we put a preacher to a place where, amen, he's like a monarch. And you can touch Jesus, but you can't touch the preacher. There's something wrong with that. If I can't get beside you and sweat and toil, you need to get another man. Amen. Pride says, well, you know, people should just do stuff for you all the time. I don't expect that. Amen. In fact, they get on to me for not letting them do stuff. But I wasn't raised that way. I was raised serving. I don't know any other thing. You say peanut brittle, I'm going to be here. Or I'll send my wife. And I'll take care of my children. Amen. You say dinner, you know, if I can be here to help, I'm going to be here to help. It's about serving. And when you serve, you know, you, when someone is serving, you go into Chick-fil-A, you know, they're teaching a culture of servitude. Walk through the door. Welcome to Chick-fil-A. What would you like? Oh, I'd like uh, number one chicken sandwich with some of them waffle fries with an unsweet tea with a shot of that sugar-free lemonade. Make sure the sandwich is grilled. And what's that? what do they say? My pleasure. And what, I, what I'm learning is in, in the food industry, I've gone to other restaurants now, and their culture is affecting other businesses. Because you start to hear, my pleasure. My pleasure. Well, I know where that started at. It started at Chick-fil-A. And if it wasn't Sunday, we could all go and get us a chicken sandwich after church. But they're closed on Sundays because they believe in going to church. But it's that attitude. My pleasure. I want our young people to understand that it is a pleasure to get to serve in the kingdom of God. It's a pleasure, amen, when you get to come and be a part of what God is doing. It's a joy. Brother Salome, it was a joy getting to stay here till 1 o'clock in the morning with you. Amen. I was tired as all get out. But there's something about when a brother and you are working together and the other men that worked so hard and the ladies that worked so hard. Sister Erica was right there with us that morning. Amen. And, and, and working away, cleaning that tile, doing a wonderful job. But she was serving the Lord. You know how come people get burnt out in serving? Because they forget who they're serving. And when you start doing it because, well, I'm serving the children's ministry or, or I'm doing it for the pastor or I'm, you know, we're, we're teaching them, hey, servitude is all about serving something and not who we serve. But I serve Jesus. Amen. Every day of the week I serve him. Somebody calls me crying and weeping, got problems. Hey, man, I got an ear to hear. You know why? 
because it's part of me serving the Lord. It's not too much. There are those who say, Brother, I'm sorry about you're not bothering me. I'm your servant. Think about it. I'm here for you. You need me to come pray? I'll come pray. You need me to come help you mow your yard? I'll help you mow your yard. You need me to fix your plumbing? Good luck. I'm not saying I won't try to help. We may not get the results you're looking for. But you know the wonderful thing about that is, is if I can't fix it, I'll find somebody who can. That's taking care of somebody. When we look at the story of the Good Samaritan, his whole thought process was, I'm going to take care of this man. I don't know him. I don't know his family. But I'm going to take care of him. Others walked by him and paid the wounded man no mind. But that good Samaritan says, I'm going to take you to a place where you can rest. I'm going to bind your wounds. He gave that man two pence and a promise. And he says, you know, this is to cover the bill. And what, what's not covered, I'll come back by and I'll pay the bill. Well, wait a second. You don't even know this guy. That's all right. It's not about knowing the man. It's about doing what's right. Serving my brother. Serving my sister. We need to teach our young people and our children about serving the king. An armor bearer was taught how to serve the king by the warrior he was assigned to. Amen. And being an armor bearer is not, a, not something that uh, uh, wasn't a glorified position. It was a servant position. You carried the armor. You carried the spears. You polished the armor. You, you, you took the water when, the, when he said get water. This is all about serving. We say I'll serve the Lord till I die. And then God says, okay, let's see. Pastor comes to you and says, hey, do you mind wiping down the... The wood in the hallway. Oh, pastor, I, you know, something flares up. And you wonder why our young people don't have a better attitude towards servanthood. Another fundraiser. Oh, here we go. Another fundraiser. Means I got to do something. I got to give something. I've got to get in there and help. I'm just going to preach a little bit tonight. And instead of complaining about it, why don't you just get in there and help? Get in there and serve. Because you're not only affecting you, you're affecting the generation behind you. They're watching you. They're hearing you, mamas and daddies. If you show up for late for church, they're going to show up late for church. If some folks showed up to their job like they show up to church, would you still have a job? Now, you know your bosses. Some of you are like, well, I would. They love me. Let's start doing it on a consistent basis. Start showing up late. And then they're going to call you in the office and say, hey, we got to talk. We open up around here at 8 o'clock. And this 845 business has got to go. Amen. I tell folks all the time, man, I'm thankful I'm not your boss. Well, 7 o'clock means 7 o'clock. I was always raised like this. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're early, you're on time. Maybe it came from back when I was in high school band. 
You know, we had to show up at 7 o'clock or before for early morning band practice. And that band instructor wanted us in our seats with our instruments ready to go right at the top of the hour. And I learned something then, that it didn't just affect me, but it affected the one beside me. Think about it, church. I know I'm, I'm building a little foundation here tonight. We're going somewhere. But we really got to take it to heart. We are training up the next generation. And if we don't want a lazy, lackadaisical church of tomorrow, then we can't be a lazy, lackadaisical church of today. I want our young people to become warriors of the cross. I want them to get a burden for prayer. I want them to understand that God has his hand upon them and wants to use them for his glory. Several years ago, amen, I was working in a church, amen, and, and just trying to find my way and living for God and, and uh, a ministry and trying to do something. The pastor said, let's work something up. Where our young men can, can, can walk with our older men. And then Saturday morning, Brother Blackburn preaching a wonderful message about protecting the blind side. Begin to talk about how as a young boy, a young man, he uh, had an alcoholic father. I know from knowing him well that his father was a truck driver, was on the road a lot, was very physically abusive to his mother. Brother Blackburn said his father, he thought that Brother Blackburn hated him, and so he hated Brother Blackburn, but Brother Blackburn said, I never hated him. I just didn't like his ways. But he said in that time, Mama took him to church, and there were 60 men that went to his mom and said, hey, we want to take some time with Roger. He said those men would take him individually and teach him how to pray and, and begin to teach him how to worship and teach him how to live for God and and, and, and how to live his life. And, and I, I recall during that time how the Lord gave me a vision of an armor bearer. First time we read of an armor bearer is when Jonathan and his armor bearer, scale a mountain and defeat over a thousand Philistines. The armor bearer was right there with him. Now, I can't prove this, and this is just a thought. But I did some studying in that time frame. We know David was somewhere around that time. We know Jonathan loved David. It wouldn't surprise me that if during that time frame, David wasn't Jonathan's armor bearer. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying that's one of my crazy ideals. But knowing his history and the way he, he believed in God, it wouldn't surprise me. But an armor bearer was, was a young man that was assigned to that warrior so he could learn how to become a warrior. He was taught how to be faithful to the king. He was taught how to get up in the morning. and He was taught how to use the weapons of their warfare. He was taught discipline. He was taught how to march. He was taught how to ride. He was taught how to talk. He was taught, I mean, they were identified by their character. Amen? And so, it was with that in mind that I, I began to look and want to create armor bearers in Peace Tabernacle. I want to see our young men and women, amen, between the ages of 13 and 18, uh, amen, you know, or even younger, 12, 11, preteen on up, assigned to a seasoned warrior of the cross. I want our men. Men, we've got to step up in this hour where we're living in. You say, Brother Bumgarner, you sure preach a lot at the men. And I, I'm sorry if that offends you, but I believe that men make the difference. I believe that ladies love Holy Ghost-filled men that take the lead. I, I, I just feel that in my bones. That when a man steps up and begins to pray, it allows her to pray. You know what I notice when these men begin to worship and shout? Man, you ladies like, oh, we don't have to lead the way. Let me shout with them. 
Come on, it's a lot easier for them to shout with us, men, than for them to try to get us to shout. I want our young people to get on fire for God. But they won't get on fire for God if the church isn't on fire for God. If mom and dad ain't on fire for God. Amen. You know, I can't expect my children to love the Word if they don't see me loving the Word. Amen. You know, I can't expect them to pray if I'm not praying more. Amen. I may have to start disturbing my wife in her sleep. They're going to start hearing Daddy pray more. Some of my most vivid memories is waking up early in the morning, 4.30, 5 o'clock, hearing that little man pray with everything he has with him, and he still does it to this day. And he prays towards the east. He says, you got to pray towards Jerusalem. That's just his thing. But I cannot do any less for my own children. I want to teach them how to worship. I don't want them coming to church and sitting like a knot on a log. I want them to get up and and worship the Lord. I want our young people to understand, hey, it's all right to clap your hands. It's all right if the music's good to do a little dance. Amen. It's all right to, to be joyful. It is. It's all right. But we got to teach them. See, they, they, this is why T.O., you're supposed to be preaching to our young people. I am. I want them to hear. Watch your mama. Watch your grandma. Watch them pray. Listen to them pray. Learn how to pray like they pray. You say, when they, they tell me, brother, where they don't pray, then shame on us. We got to be like those sequoia trees. Brother Team, we got to be able to put out those feelers, those branches, those roots. We got to wrap them around our young people. Because the storms of life are going to come at them. And we've got to be able to hold them up. We got to keep them going. We got to teach them to put on the whole armor of God. We want them, when they reach the age of maturity, to be equipped to fight the enemy on any front. Now, I'm as guilty as anybody, and I, believe me, if I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to me. That I can get so self-contained in my own relationship that I, I, I just keep it to myself. I catch myself sometimes just you know, praying, and, and I get in that, that quiet mode of prayer, you know. I call it stealth mode. You're praying, and you're there, but nobody sees you. <laughs> but I want my children to hear me pray. And it's not how loud you pray. You don't have to be a yeller. We know from the from the Pharisees and the publicans, it's not how loud you pray. It's how sincerely you pray. You know, I told my wife, I said, you, you got us all convicted. I told her after that message, you know what, we're going to start doing devotions here at the house every night. We got to get these babies trained right. We're going to read out of these Bible storybooks. We're going to talk about Amen. Uh, things of God. We're going to teach them how to pray. We're going to teach them how to worship. Come on, it's my job. Not the churches. Did you hear me? And yet, it is the churches in reflection of what happens here. Because we can't tell them get up and shout if we don't get up and shout. We can't expect them to learn what it is to feel the power of God move on us, it, 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 on them if it never moves on us. Now I know I'm just digging, I'm plowing tonight, and I'm okay with that. 
Ephesians 6 and 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breath place of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And we're living in a dark hour. We're living in a day and age that you're going to need to have on the whole armor of God. If you're going to make it, you need to have the whole armor of God on. We need to have and we need to teach about their loins being girded about with truth. If we're going to reach this generation and see them make heaven their home, we've got to pass on the truth of God's Word. They've got to know who Jesus is. That there's only one God, and His name is Jesus. Beware, Colossians 2 and 8, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of of the Godhead bodily. They need to understand there's only one Lord and one faith and one baptism and that's in Jesus' name that there is no Trinity. There is no triune Godhead. There's only one Lord, one faith and one baptism and one Lord above all, through all and in you all. I keep going back to that scripture tonight for some reason but it's, there's only one God and His name is Jesus. They need to know the oneness of God. I'm believing God's going to let some men latch on to some young men and teach them the oneness of God. They need to understand baptism in Jesus' name. How many have been baptized in Jesus' name? How many of our young people have been baptized in Jesus' name? Don't you know you need to be baptized in Jesus' name? Unless you are baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. Your sins are not covered under the blood. We've got to teach them about the power of the name of Jesus. That when, your na when, you, when that name's applied to you in that watery grave, amen, his name, it's a family name. That's why I call you brother and you call me brother and I call you sister. Amen. Because we become brothers and sisters because we have the same family name. No longer is it Jesse Waddy. It's Jesse Ben Jesus. <laughs> it's not Michael Bumgarner anymore. It's Michael Ben Jesus and Keith Ben Jesus and Loopy Ben Jesus. Come on. We, we all have that same surname attached to our, our life. Our, we, our identification has changed. We're now a part of his identity, his family. And let me just throw this kicker, and I'm as guilty as anybody. Hey, man, you know, we like to say, well, you know, uh, uh, yeah, that's just the old Bumgarner coming out of me. Well, old Bumgarner needs to get on down the road because you're no longer Bumgarner. You're Jesus. Because na his name was applied. And the old man got put down in the watery grave. And the new man came up. Uh, and the old man died. But the new ma na man's got a new name. We got to teach our, they got to know truth. 
Because there's going to be those that come up and say, it don't take all that. You don't have to be baptized in Jesus' name. It's all right if you just get baptized, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But that's not a name. If you think that's a name, I'll write you a million dollar check and just put Father, Son, and Spirit on it. And if the bank cashes it, you got to split it with me. And we'll both run for Mexico. <laughs> but you know as well as I do, they'll look at that and laugh. And they'll say, there's no name. Where's the name? Well, Father's the name. Father's not a name, it's a title. What about son? Well, that ain't a name, that's a title. Well, I got a spirit, so I put spirit on there. But spirit's not your name, so I'm sorry, this check's no good. You're going to have to put your name on it. And let me tell you something, the Bible lets us know that if you don't have the spirit of the Lord in you, you're none of his. If you don't have his name, you're none of his. That's why we got to be baptized in Jesus' name. we got to reach our young people with the, with the truth. We've got to let them know you must receive the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We, we, we have to let them know unless you receive the Holy Ghost, you're lost. But you got to be born again of water and of spirit. That's the word of God. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus. Unless you're born of water and of spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I want to be able to go. But we've got to make sure the next generation knows. They need to know that I'm going to serve the Lord. They've got to say it like Joshua did in Joshua 24, 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house. You know what? That needs to be more than just a plaque you put over your door. Come on, I've been in lots of people's houses and they got that plaque on the wall. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Well, you better get started. You better start cleaning your house. You better get your spirit right. You need to start coming to church more. You need to learn how to praise him more. Because if they're going to serve the Lord, then you need to serve the Lord. Come on, if, our, if we want our young people to serve the Lord, then we need to serve the Lord. If we want to empower the next generation, then we got to be full of the power. Come on, talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. So don't tell me, oh, we're going to serve the Lord if you're not going to serve the Lord. Because they know you can't fool them. They know what truth is. They know what a hypocrite is. 